go. Good evening and welcome. We, <laughs> um, it is very exciting to uh, welcome you all here this evening, and uh, I hope this is kind of the beginning of a new era in Harkham College and uh, Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church's relationship. So. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. It's been wonderful to have discussions with people over dinner, and um, it's lovely to see the chapel this full, and we are delighted to welcome you to this space, of which we're very proud, of course. Um, and we uh, actually at Bryn Mawr Press have been doing for this year a theme in our adult education opportunities, um, and then our theme was bread. So, and what we've discovered in looking at uh, that theme of food and who's hungry and um, communion and various other aspects of bread is one of the, the learnings from that for us has been that there is actually plenty for everybody and that um, it's, we need to get away from an attitude of scarcity and um, understand that actually God does provide and for our, from our perspective um, plenty for everyone and that we need to start from that assumption. So uh, this lecture for us was, was a godsend. <laughs> to, to use a good form of expression. Um, in that it seemed to fit so perfectly with our ongoing theme and even with some of the emphases that, that we're uh, looking at in that theme. So we're very delighted uh, that you're here and that uh, Mr. Oppenheimer is here. So uh, welcome, and I will hand this over to, but Harkham, let me say, organized it, is responsible for it, thought of it, and all that stuff, so they have to take all the credit for all of that, but we're just uh, the, the, the delighted hosts. But, and then with that, I'm going to hand it over to your, uh, to Harkham College's president, and uh, continue the evening, so enjoy. Thanks, Pastor Nicole. Welcome to the second in our lecture series for celebrating our centennial. For those of you who may not know, most of you probably do, you know, Arkham has been around 100 years now. We've always had a good relationship with Renmark Presbyterian. You know, for many, many years, our graduation was in the larger facility, in the sanctuary, uh, until last year was the first time we just got too big and started out growing it our graduation on the Great Lawn in front of the Academic Center. So we're really very pleased to be back uh, with Bryn Mawr Press. In fact, I've never been in the chapel. It's a beautiful facility, and I feel very fortunate that we've been able to partner, and I really appreciate the hospitality. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I just wanted to say hello. Uh, introducing Gary Oppenheimer tonight is Professor Alex Holosky, so I'm going to invite her up to do the introduction. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, enjoy the lecture. We have more lectures coming. We have a total of six to celebrate our centennial. So enjoy. Seven years, 
his ampleharvest.org was born. Three years after, ampleharvest.org has registered nearly 5,000 food pantries nationwide. Did you know that within a few miles of Renmar, there are more than 20 food pantries from Wynwood to Marion to Philadelphia and Norristown where home gardeners can donate their ex excess produce because of Gary Oppenheimer and ampleharvest.org. In 2010, Gary was named the greatest person of the day by the Huffington Post for uh, confronting hunger and food waste in the United States with creativity, generosity, and passion. Gary Oppenheimer has grown more than vegetables. He's grown a powerful community, building enterprises that help for fight poverty, malnutrition, obesity, diabetes, and food waste just by making connections. Please welcome our very special presenter, Gary Oppenheimer. Thank you very much to the Presbyterian Church. This is gorgeous. And I am so moved by this. This is just so cool. This is already up on our Facebook page. So um, <laughs> thank you. And probably I should thank you because also, you know, there's no food left behind slogan. I borrowed, I thought from President Bush. He'd actually borrowed that from somebody else. So whoever came up and he you knows something left something, thank you to, to, uh, to you. Um, This is what you often see in front of, you know, when you go into a lecture or something like that. Not here. Take your phones out, silence them, please. Don't make calls or receive calls. But this is, good. I'm going to talk to you about ample harvest stuff. I'm going to talk to you about what brought it about. I want to talk to you about the conditions in America that called for it and the solution that was in response to it. But I would love it if you became a part of it. While I'm talking, text. Alex, tweet, whatever you want to do, Twitter out to your friends, your family, your network about what's going on. Periodically, you'll see a slide coming up like this, and what you'll see will be at Ample Harvest, and then something in red under that. In this case, no food left behind. If, that's, if you want to send that out, do it. If you want to send something else out, do it too. The heart of ampleharvest.org is a very viral campaign. It's people saying, I get it. I like it, and I want to be a part of it turning on to their own network of friends and family across all 50 states to share this information. So, number one, please be a part of this and feel free to use your phones and tablets to send it out. We are on Facebook, we have a blog, uh, Google Plus, Twitter, obviously like everybody else. Follow us, get engaged with us by social media. As I talk about this, I'd like you to think about how this applies to you. What is it that we've done that actually moves you? And what is it that we're doing that actually might apply to where your passions are and how you can take those particular things forward? This is not an end game solution. This is not the final step. This is an important big step and it's a good innovation, but there's many more steps to be taken as we deal with some critical problems in America. And I hope this is gonna energize some of you to be a part of that. Any trekkies in here? All right, for those of you, the Z minus 10,000 meters may ring a bell. And if not, we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. But this is an important part of where I want you thinking. Lastly, I don't want you thinking that I'm any smarter or more powerful or anything than any of you are. I'm not. I'm an aging geek. I have a really good idea and a passion that I wanted to address. But I don't think that that's something different from what any of you have in your lives, too. So as we talk about ampleharvest.org, and we talk about how it came about and what's involved. Think about the things that are important to you in your life, whatever it is, and how can you take this idea and make it work for you? So that's the housekeeping stuff that I wanted to, uh, to do with you here. In doing so, the one key thing to remember when you're going to pursue any endeavor <coughs> is that to do the impossible, you must first believe it isn't. 
A lot of people, no matter what you're going to do, are going to say, yeah, somebody could have done it already, it could have been done, or it's never going to work. If you think you're right, you're pursuing it. When I started ampleharvest.org almost six years ago, it was an idea and nobody ever did anything quite like it before. And I actually had a guy in New Jersey, a state official, say, well, try it in New Jersey, and if it works, then you can do it nationwide. And I said, New Jersey and New Mexico have the exact same problems. I did it on a nationwide basis. I took the presumption that I can do anything by simply saying I'm going to. This is probably a number you haven't seen before, and if you don't want to count the zeros, it's $1.033 trillion. We'll get to this at the end also, just keep that in mind. It's a big number. You know, I think it was said in a full writer once said a billion here, a billion days, and you're talking real numbers. We're talking over a trillion dollars here. So we're going to be breaking this evening down into four big areas. And as we're doing this, I'd like you to think about questions because there are going to be things that are going to come to you I want you to ask me about and maybe criticisms or things you want to challenge me on. You know, we can have that discussion. I do want this to turn into a discussion uh, when I'm done speaking. We're going to cover wasted food, the impact of solution, and the future. Let me start by asking a show of hands. How many of you are aware of the fact that wasted food is a serious issue in this country? That's more than I would have seen a year or two ago. It is a very serious issue. More than half of the produce in this country is not consumed. And this is a global issue, by the way. We're going to talk about the United States, but this is an issue that spans across the, the entire world. 4% of our energy and 12.5% of our fresh water is lost because of the food that we're not eating. Now, you might think 12.5% of, 12 of the water, well, New Jersey's relatively wet, we've got a little snow outside. But our biggest agricultural states, California, in a perpetual drought, and they're just wasting away their water. So the, the impact of the waste of food goes beyond the food you don't eat. It's the other resources that we are using and then wasting. Half the produce in this country is not consumed. This is from a report from the National Resource Defense Council. If you're interested in seeing it for yourself, then I would strongly encourage you to read it. You can find it at ampleharvest.org forward slash NRDC was written by a friend of not a friend of mine, Dana, who is brilliant. And it goes to the point of how significant the food loss is. And by the way, just for the uh, record, everybody's at fault. Starts at the farmer and ends at your and my kitchen table. So it's the entire spectrum of where food moves. But for example, 2% of all potatoes, 8% of the corn, and almost a fifth of all the wheat in this country is not consumed. And 6% of the land on which things are farmed simply don't get harvested. So instead of thinking about lost food, I'd like you to start thinking a little bit bigger and start thinking about lost opportunity. Because that food represents an opportunity for the health of the nation and the people in it. I just came back from England. My daughter um, is living in London. She recently graduated from Cambridge, and she was suffering from a little bit of uh, homesickness. So I did a daddy intervention and actually flew out there with a piece of New York, Sunday Times, some San Jose bars and stuff. And we had a lovely time out there. We went on a, uh, there was something, a big Ferris wheel type thing in London called the Eye. And we went there, and after that we went to the Belfast, which is a big battleship. And I was coming through the gift shop, something I normally don't do, and here was a book in the gift shop, a replica, of course, from 1942, for American servicemen serving in Great Britain. And this was to acclimate American servicemen about what life is like, the culture, the language, the people, so that they would melt as, as good as possible. I opened up to a page, and of all things, and this is purely coincidental, what I opened up to reads, wasted, waste means lies. It's always been said that Americans throw more food into their garbage cans than any other country eats. That was 1942. We haven't gotten any better. But it's not a new problem. We've been having this for a long time. For me, this was a tipping point. In 2008, Bill Marsh, a photographer for the New York Times, did an article. The New York Times did an article about the waste of food in America. And Bill Marsh, the photographer for the Times, assembled this picture. This is a representation of the food wasted or lost, I should say, in America by a family of four in one month. It's about a pound a person a day, it's about 100 pounds, uh, 100 billion pounds a year. 
And at the time, amplehawks.org didn't exist. I was doing other things. This was not really on my mind a whole lot, but this stuck with me. It was a very good visual to tell me there's something that I wasn't aware of that was not right. And a year later, it clicked. What we've all seen is this. This is the waste of food, whether it's from a backyard garden or the food out of the back of the supermarket or maybe stuff that's been thrown away by a farm because the food that was harvested was either below grade or too small or too big or what is now popularly called ugly fruit. Have any of you heard the term ugly fruit? If you haven't, you will. It's the stuff that's perfectly wholesome, perfectly edible, and perfectly perfect, except for the fact that it doesn't look like it. the specs that a supermarket wants. It gets thrown away. There's now a movement underway to try to get that food back into the system so that it doesn't get wasted. But this is where a great deal of our food actually goes. And this is food that could be nourished in the country instead of just gets thrown out. Uh, for those of you who go to the library here at Harkin, I was asked about books to recommend, and this is the one that first came to mind. It's American Wasteland by Jonathan Bloom. Jonathan was the gentleman who actually gave AmpleHarvest.org its first spotlight because he wrote about it a few days after it was launched. But this is an excellent book, but the key piece of information in this book is that the amount of food that we waste is enough to fill the Rose Bowl. This is, by the way, every day. We can fill the Rose Bowl without wasting food every day of the year. Uh, I was talking to somebody over dinner about the environmental impact of wasted food, and the red section there represents the amount of food that America sent to landfill. 2007, 18% of our landfill waste disposal is wasted food. Now, in my town, um, the food, the you know, garbage gets picked up and taken away just like probably is in your town, and that's part of your town taxes. So whatever you're paying in terms of sanitation costs, think about the fact that 18% of that tax money is going to take away stuff that didn't have to be taken away. Um, and you should also know that when it comes to vegetative material, kitchen scraps or whatever it is, you throw them into the garbage, in a trash dump, in an anaerobic environment, which means no oxygen, they actually end up releasing uh, methane. Now, methane's a climate change gas that's seen. A pound of methane is the equivalent of a pound, 20 pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. So a pound of vegetative material becomes a pound of methane, 20 pounds of CO2. So now start thinking about the kitchen scraps and food that we're wasting as a something that's adding to climate change in this country. Actually, what we should say. I'm a master gardener. Can I ask what, how many people here have home, or, home gardens or grow in community plots? All right, good number of you. All right. Well, you're part of 42 million people in this country, about 35% of all households that grow food. And that's been a climbing number. By the way, 9 million of them are in urban settings. It's not just the suburban and rural setting. And the average harvest, and I know for some of you have had small pots, it doesn't make sense, but some are 300 pounds, but that's National Garden Association numbers. And having harvested from my garden, 300 pounds is on the low end. Um, but we do harvest a fairly healthy amount of food. What's interesting has been the growth in home and community gardens. It's been 17% increase in the past five years. We have millennials, the young people here, 63% of you folks are now growing food that's been in the past. And community gardening is up 200%. So this is something that Americans are doing more and more. And at the same time, that talks about the greater and greater opportunity to do something to nourish the country. Many of us, and I'll be the first to admit it, many of us grow more than we can use, preserve, or share with friends. I, at one time, grew too much food. And my wife, at a certain point, said, no more is coming in the house. I tried giving it away. And I can tell you there's only so, so many cucumbers you can give to friends and still have them for your friend. Um, that actually got me out looking to find out what could I do with food. And in my town, I happen to know the woman who ran the bad woman's shelter in the town. And I called up and Sandra, I've got this food, can you use it? She said, sure, bring it over. So I did. And a lovely lady entered the door. This was in 2007. A lovely lady entered the door and I gave her two shopping bags of food. And she said, thank you. And as I'm walking away, she said, now we can have some fresh food. Now I thought it was kind of a weird thing to hear, because it just was out of the blue. 
The following year, 2008, I took food from my garden to the same battered women's shelter, and I had the same lady actually enter the door. I gave her two or three bags, and she said the exact same thing. This became an eye-opener. Something wasn't quite right. Here I'm showing up with Swiss chard and tomatoes and zucchinis, whatever else I was growing. And she was leaving me with the impression that all she was getting there was processed food. And I think that was another tipping point for me. But people grow too much because they can't share it with friends or their friends don't want anymore. By the way, I was told in the South, people lock their cars. They're not afraid of the car being stolen. They're afraid of coming back to a couple of zucchini. So this is a <laughs> national issue. Um, but the other thing is people get bored and they get overwhelmed. Um, you know, for those of you who garden, you put the tomato seeds in or whatever you're growing, you wait. Well, right now we wait for something we can garden. I mean, we wait for a nice weather, but you wait and you wait and you wait. And the plants finally come up and you feed and you water and you nurse it along. And then suddenly you get your food. Now remember that 300 pounds? Up here in the north, it's not 300 pounds over 12 months, that's 300 pounds over like six, eight, ten weeks. So you're really, really, really overwhelmed. And there's reaching the point in which you say enough already, but your plants haven't gotten the message, so they're still producing. Um, it's an ongoing issue that, 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 that just goes on and on, and it's another it's part of the food waste decision. <laughs> the USDA and the um, National Resource Defense Council both talked about the source, the amount of, of wasted food and where that food is actually wasted. And all these numbers, which are all really not too important for this discussion, except for the red one here and the green one here. On a national level, this represents the fruit, this represents the vegetables on a national level that are not consumed. The one thing they haven't done because nobody's able to do it is knock on your back door and say, how much food's wasted in your garden? We all know that gardeners grow more than they can use. I'm a perfect example, some of you may be. But that's never been documented. So whatever these numbers are, the amount that's lost from home and community gardens needs, needs to be added into here. And we're right now talking to some people about actually doing a survey to get some good numbers up, but we know it's taking place. It has just never been documented. But I took the assumption, I'm sorry, that based on my experience as a gardener and growing too much food, that if I was growing too much food, so is everybody else. Which means this number, these two numbers here may well be a good deal bigger than that in terms of the amount of food wasted in America. Now, to give you an idea of the scope and the waste of that food, I'd like to read you a few letters. search of a local organization that will be able to use the Valencia oranges and pink grapefruit from my two trees in the backyard. I'd like to trim the trees back, but I don't want to simply throw the plentiful fruit, fruit into the trash. If someone could help me, please let me know. Uh, I work at a public school teacher in a Title I economically disadvantaged vicinity of eastern Texas. My family garden typically yields a surplus of organic zucchini every year. Please let me know if any families might be in need of the extra food. Um, let's see, I'm pleased to inform you that we can see the seeds of the, this particular person's project developing, donated 500 pounds of fresh vegetables to four pantries. This is just before the, the, the mission had started. They want to thank you. I'll just do one more here. Um, we'll do this one. I'm a gardener in the warmer months. There is a need in my community for a help with food. Last summer I had too much produce, no way to share. Please let me know how I can fix that problem. I have lots of these. I think those who didn't write were thinking it. This is not a, a local problem, this is on a national scale. Those letters come to us from 49 states. I haven't yet received one from Alaska, but their growing season is really short. But people do grow stuff in Alaska. So what's the impact of the food that we have but that we don't use? All right. We have 15 million people in this country who are food insecure. That's basically one out of six Americans. So in this room, if you look around you and roughly with your arm reach is probably six people and if the other five people are not hungry, it's possibly you. Um, the red here is not the Republican states, I want to be clear about that. This is to take the combined population of these 23 states that you now know what 
50 million people looks like. More people in this country are food insecure or hungry than the population of Canada. I should explain food insecurity, it's a fancy term. Uh, we think about hungry people as somebody whose stomach is growling that haven't had food, and that is accurate. But there's another problem in this country, which are people who have access to food, but they're not secure in that access. So if you open up your kitchen cabinet, and there's a single can of tuna fish in there, and that's it, you're not hungry yet, but there's a good chance you're going to be. You also have a significant population in this country to whom their main supply of food is a bodega or a gas station where they're not really getting what we might call quality food, they're getting whatever they can get there, food insecurity. So it's a significant problem in this country. What makes it worse is that in this country, one out of four children under the age of six, unless they're African American or Hispanic, that's one out of three, are growing up in a home that is food insecure. Think of that number of young people in this country who are not at a very critical age in their life getting the nutrition that they need and have families that can't feed them the way they would like to be fed, or they ought to be fed. The impact of, the, of food, we all know, we read about, whether it's obesity or diabetes or what have you. Uh, for many of us, the diet-related illnesses that we have are a product of some of the bad decisions we might have made. Of course, it's genetics and other things. I don't want to take away from that. But for many, many, many families, the problem is a result of what is available to them. Processed food and almost no fresh food because we've been throwing that fresh food away. So we're dealing with issues of childhood obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and other food-related illnesses on a national scale. Meanwhile, we've been throwing away an awful lot of fresh food that I could have donated from my garden. 2013, I was honored to be awarded points of light which is an award thing from President Bush's foundation. And while I was at the cemetery, um, by the way, my staff was really excited about that because not so much that the award was won, it was the first time they had seen me in a tuxedo. <laughs> and people who know me know that's a really rare sight. Uh, but I had met General Clark, he was army retired there, and we were talking about this issue. And it turns out that three quarters of the kids who apply for military service are rejected because they're not to serve. Now granted, some of that not fit to serve may be psychological issues or something else, but for too many of them, they are physically not fit to serve. If you go back to the kids we're raising, the one out of four kids under the age of six and the food they're getting, we're creating a national security issue by having a whole generation of kids growing up who are not fit for military service. And Michael Pollan has well said that this may be the first generation where the kids die before their parents do. Don't live as long as the parents. I also periodically get emails from people who are in need of food. Now, we're not a food bank. We're not a food pantry. We don't give food away. But people find what we're doing on the internet and they say, can you help me? And so I want to read a few of those to you. Hi, I am in need of food for my three-year-old son and I. My unemployment ran out and I still have not found a job. Can you help? Hi, my name is Judy. My family is in need of food. I found your site on the web. I'm disabled. My husband is laid off. Only one child at home. She's 11. I don't have transportation. We get food stamps, but they don't last. We still have five days left before they come out and we're completely out of food. If you know someone who can help, please let us know. We need food assistance. We have no food. I have two sons that are juniors at high school. I'm disabled. My husband works at a company. We found the chapter 13 to save our house. Our oldest son has Asperger's syndrome, Tourette's, ADHD, and OCD. We had to save the house for him. The budget that seemed to be good at the time, but now we're unable to pay our bills. Uh, where can we get some food assistance? And there was one other one that came to me a couple of years ago that actually really hurt. A woman wrote to me with a letter very similar to this. I have trouble feeding my family. My husband's not well. I've got a kid. And she was active duty U.S. Navy. So we have people in our military who are serving us and are struggling to feed their families. 
The whole point of this discussion is to say that the discussion about the food issue is not a function of those folks on the other side of the railroad tracks. It's us. This is not a them issue, it's an us issue. I can tell you from first-hand experience, my wife was laid off a while back and she was unemployed for a year, looking for work, but she wasn't able to find a job. Had we not had the economic buffer to tide us over, we might have gone to a food pantry, a middle class family going to a food pantry. You go to food pantries, you go to soup kitchens, and it's not just people going in with worn, tired clothing, it's people who look like anybody else in this room who says, I need help feeding my family. I want to discuss what the food bank system, our food safety net looks like, because this is the heart of the problem, and it also, by the way, is the solution that I found. So we're going to start with, uh, well, let me jump the point right there. The Red Dot in the Middle is an organization called Feeding America. It used to be known in its earlier life as Second Harvest. It's a very big membership organization with a $1.1 billion budget. And they act as the nexus for all of the food banks in the United States. Now connected to them are 203 regional food banks, those blue balls. And Phil Abundance, for example, covers this area. And I want you to think of a food bank as a warehouse. It's where large amounts of food come in. It's where, it's a distribution place. It's not where hungry families go to get food. It's sort of that intermediary point where food comes in. They get government food, corporate donations, donations from people like you. Uh, feeding America's all sorts of sourcing takes place and it comes into that into those. Connected to the food banks are food pantries. Now that's I'm gonna use a very generic term for this discussion tonight. Because there are food pantries, there are soup kitchens, there are summer feeding programs, there are bad women shelters, there are a variety of food programs for the sake of simplicity I'm gonna use the word food pantry. A food pantry is a place that you come to to get food to help feed your family. It's not a, a meal program. It's sort of like going to a supermarket without a cash register. You go in, you may, depending upon the state, you're registered or you're not registered, get the food and, and you go home. Um, the working number we work with in the United States are 33,500 food pantries across all 50 states. And by the way, that's up 5,000 from when Ample Harvest started in 2009. So the need is clearly being met by, by the food pantries. They're in houses of worship, they're in civic buildings, they're in YMCA's. The one thing they aren't is easy to find. So here's what happens with food. Um, up the lower right there, that's, we're gonna visualize a warehouse type setting. Then you have that blue line, that, let's think of that as time. And that's an important line here. I want you to think about it as a stretched out period of time. And then the food gets to the food pantries, and then it gets to the hungry people. That's how the system works. So whether it's cornflakes or bread or what have you, it's distributed generally from the food banks to the food pantries over a couple of weeks, and it gets out to the people who really need it. But that blue line is a choke point in the system. And nobody ever noticed that before. And I looked at that and said, we can do better. Cornflakes, bread, the staples go very well. There's no real urgency in Russia dealing with that. And yes, some produce like tomatoes or onions, I'm sorry, potatoes or onions that are fine too. But most of the stuff that gardeners grow will survive several weeks. And that's why you've always been told jars, cans, and boxes, no fresh food. The food bank system couldn't handle it because that particular choke point was too long, too narrow, too constrained to allow fresh food that's in the community to get to the people who really need it. So you have the jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food. So gardeners like me, that's not me, by the way, that's a beautiful harvest. But you have gardeners like me, and possibly like you saying, I got this food, and being turned away from food drivers. Has anybody ever driven down the street and seen a sign like this? Yeah, they don't exist. Food pantries are, as I said, in the house of worship, someplace in the basement, and there's no sign there. So even if you thought, let me call, find a place to donate to, you wouldn't know where to go. That happens, by the way, be the food pantry where Animal Harvest of first signed up. This is in, in uh, northern New Jersey. It's the oldest Catholic church in, in the state. Um, 
So that's the real heart of the problem, is that even for those who wanted to donate and who thought about violating the notes, the jar scan boxes thing, they, could, they didn't know where to go. So the result is that gardeners are basically wasting food. There's only so much you can use, the rest is going into compost, or worse, you're throwing it away. If you're not allowed to compost in your neighborhood, you're now adding to the waste stream, you're creating methane, all really, really bad things. So the idea that I had, and this is the aging geek in me, back in 2009, I had uh, this idea of, well, what if we could have a system to allow actually donate the food? And what I realized was the problem that we had was a twofold issue. One was people thought they couldn't donate the food because they've been always told jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food. And even if they wanted to donate, they didn't know where. So I thought the idea was let's tell people you can, let's tell them where they can. Educate, encourage, and enable the donation of fresh food. So the one thing I realized was we had the food in the community. We had the need for it in the community, and oh yeah, now we have the internet. So, while I've been running a community garden in my town, people had said to me, we really are frustrated by the fact that food is being wasted. And, and, and this just rolled up my tongue. This was no forethought to this, and this statement brought me to this stage. I said, if we're gonna have an ample harvest, the least we can do is give the people in the community a real need. If they love the idea. That's where I discovered that I couldn't find a food pantry in my town. The nearest one was in Morristown, New Jersey, 25 miles away from the Google, which I knew was wrong. And so I went home and had an idea, which was that. And I went on the internet the next morning to say, let me see if amplehawks.org is a domain is available. And it was, and I bought it for $9. Now, I grew up hating waste. For those of you who've um, uh, see my TED talk, it starts with me saying, my grandparents and mother always said, finish what's on your plate, kids are starving, you're about to think, okay, if they did, you don't waste. I just spent $9, I was not going to let that go to waste. <laughs> I was, as silly as it sounds, and I, um, over a couple of hours, sat down, and I started writing, what can I do with this? And three hours later, I had a fairly significant PowerPoint presentation outline put together, which ultimately became what is amplehawks.org. This whole thing was an epiphany that came out in one seating. The idea was to enable growers to find a pantry, enable pantries to be found, but enable the growers to take food directly to the food pantries and to bypass the choke point in the system. So the result would be that the processed food that the food banks always provide to the food pantries would be delivered to the food pantries as it always has been. No change there. The difference is that the food that the growers had instead of going to the compost could now be going to a local food pantry and getting people really need it. It didn't seem like rocket science to me. It still doesn't. Although I have to say I haven't quite figured out what rocket science is. But the point is that the that was the fix to the system. And the reason I brought up the thing earlier on about what are your passions because Sometimes those fixes are not terribly complicated. This is a really good example of how simple a fix to a problem can actually be. So the net net is that food from a harvest, instead of being blocked from going to a food bank, could not go directly to a food pantry. And once you were connected to a food pantry in your neighborhood, that was a permanent, lifelong, sustainable connection to the food pantry. For the rest of your gardening life, every time you have too many tomatoes or zucchinis, you knew that St. Mary's Church or Beth Shalom or the YMCA was there to take the food and you would donate it to them. So in effect, the, what the goal here was not to have a problem where you had continual fixes, but actually have a solution to a problem, which is the blockage of the food. And by the way, the blockage of the goodwill, I should say, because if the fact that you wanted to donate the food, but you were afford it in the past, this unleash the food and your goodwill. Um, so food that would have, this food that might have been thrown away, even from small farmers, and was now getting to uh, food pantries and the hungry people across the country who were needing it. Um, in a little while, you're going to see a video. Um, when I was introduced before, you had mentioned that the uh, HuffPost called me the greatest person whatever it was of the day. 
Much to my wife's distress, in the last week of December 2014, Yahoo News and ABC News named me best person in the world. It was a gross overstatement, I promise you. But you'll see the video. But um, the important thing is the food pantry that we went to to do the filming, and you can read this in the text, she said that since they became a part of AnimalHarvest.org, um, one third of the food they distribute in the growing season is locally donated fresh food. Now that's not going to be every food pantry. I don't want to in any way present this as that factor. There are going to be many pantries that get done or get a lot less. We had one pantry that reported getting 9 million pounds in a year. I pulled them up, I thought it was a typo. I said, no, a farmer shop is putting food. It opens up a supply channel. And whether you're getting a third of the food or some, a single shopping bag, it's food in the community that was no longer going to waste and instead you get to the people who most needed it. So how does it all work? Well. The biggest part of our work is the educating and the uh, encouragement. It's the media, social media, speeches like this. It's really you folks tweeting and emailing and telling your friends and family across the country. You're, it's a huge part of this. But uh, that spreads the word that you can donate. It's also a big help from organizations, companies like Google, that gives us uh, almost half a million dollars a year of free advertising. But it's also the website, which is an opt-in national registry of food pantries. Food pantries uh, sign up, totally free. They put in their information. We verify that they meet our standards, which are very simple, nonprofit. They give the food away for free. Which, and then it's effectively like you turn on the front porch light of the food pantry, and the community can now find them. So what happens? You're a gardener, and you um, say, OK, I've got way too many cucumbers here. No, I don't want those. I heard this guy on stage who lost some, so I don't want that to happen to me. So you put in your zip code, and how far are you willing to travel, and up comes a list of pantries that are in our system. You then pick the pantry that's most convenient to you, and up comes the information that, that they put in, and then you deal directly with them. So one really cool thing about AmpleHarms.org is we have zero logistics. We don't touch the food, we don't see the food. We've made a bridge, a link between you and the food pantry in your town. Which is really cool for everything except the fact that we can't brag about your food because we don't get to see it, but we're bragging about you being able to do it. But the two things that are on this that are also really valuable innovations, the first is that um, for the first time ever, food pantries are able to tell donors what day of the week and what time of the day to come. That's really important for two reasons. One is that, let, let's say you have a food pantry that is, is uh, giving out food to their clients on Sundays from noon to three, for argument's sake. They ideally would tell their clients, yeah, that's the gardeners, I'm sorry, to come maybe Sunday from nine to noon. Come a few hours before the clients are picking up the food. That little bit of manipulation of information and time does the following. Number one, the gardener now knows when he or she should harvest the food from the garden, Sunday morning, Saturday night, whatever. They take it in, it's sitting on a table at the food pantry for a few hours, the clients come in, take it home. The clients are getting food fresher than you and I can buy in a supermarket. Number two, no refrigeration and no storage at the food pantry is needed. There's nothing that you harvest, I promise you, that needs to be refrigerated the same day. Because one of the things that was scary in some food pantries is we don't have refrigeration. We barely have the room for the milk and the butter. We don't have room for the produce. This eliminates that because the food is, it's called just in time inventory for those who are familiar with that idea. The food just flows through. The other piece, and this is not often talked about, but I think it should be, is ethical. Um, in our current economic climate, yes, the economy is getting better, but still there are many people who are still hurting. In our current economic climate, it's entirely plausible that you have too much food and you're going to donate and your friend or next door neighbor has fallen the hard times and they're going to a food pantry. Now they're feeling a little bad about that. They shouldn't, honestly, in my opinion. The reality is that when I'm feeling sick, I go to the doctor and I'm embarrassed about that. Why you should feel bad about going to a food pantry if you have a hard time? I don't know, but people do and I grant them. If I show up with my food while you're there getting food, I might be embarrassed and you may well be humiliated. Uh, the idea, if we separate you by a little bit of time, I know the food's helping somebody in my community, but I don't know who. And you as a recipient know the food came from somebody in the community, but you don't know who. No embarrassment, no humiliation, 
and at the same time that anonymity makes it a, I think, an ethically improved environment for giving food. So that's a real plus for time management. This is the other piece here. Uh, this happens in a particular food pantry that I'm very fond of because they opened my eyes. I created ampleharvest.org and I didn't realize what I created. This often happens. Like if any of you are artists, you put a pencil or a brush of the paper, and if you step back and realize, wow, uh, that happened to me in this case. His pants food cupboard in Brighton, Colorado did something I hadn't expected. This was an early food pantry. Um, they, we had a field in there called additional information. I thought you call me before you come, use the back door. They started talking about the things that they really needed. Um, they were talking about non-perishable food, personal hygiene things, baby food, diapers, things they need. And I looked at some of my God, they're talking back to the community. Have you ever gone to a food drive where they've actually said, we really want this and we really don't want that? Ah, that's not the way it typically works. For the first time, we were giving a food pantry the chance to tell the donors, we really could use this. And I realized that this made a dramatically improved environment in terms of the, the market now, because the people who were donating food could actually be guided towards what's most needed. For example, somebody in a food drive wouldn't be bringing pork and beans to a pantry serving a Jewish or Muslim community, for example. And that makes for a much more efficient system. So this opened the door for a two-way link now between the need and the donors in the community. There are lots of innovations in ampleharvest.org, and this is the type of slide that you're always told in PowerPoint not to do because it's a lot of bullet points and boring, but I want to look just the red ones because these are the ones I think are most important. Number one, reduces food waste. And in my opinion, you now know how I feel about waste. I think that's a really critical thing to be doing. Number two, we didn't build really anything new or connecting dots. We're using the existing legacy infrastructure of the growers, the pantries, and the internet. This is a lifelong solution. Once you know you can donate the food, it's fixed. You're not going to waste food in your garden anymore. You and probably your circle of friends and neighbors now know that the food can be donated. We clean up on the environment, reducing the waste stream, of course. And lastly, and this is something to think about, the nation's health care costs can get reduced. When I first wrote out at harvest.org, in 09, Sasha Abramson wrote an article a week or two later in the Huffington Post about AmpleHarvest.org. And he wrote something, I, I never heard of this guy, he wrote something that had not crossed my mind before. He said this will probably have a, an impact on the nation's long-term long -term health care costs. Now this was happening during the Obamacare debate in, in Congress, so it was big on, on, on the discussion. But when you think about if finally we're getting fresh food to young people particularly who don't have access to it, if we're getting kids fresh produce, instead of canned produce that's in heavy syrup or fresh vegetables rather than vegetables and salt, you have a chance to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes or reduce the incidence of things like hypertension down the road. So this allows us to actually improve the food system and improve the nation's health. This is such a cool picture. I went to school in Bridgeport, Connecticut a long time ago. It's an urban city, for those of you who haven't been there, it's, it's it's, it, it's a fairly tired urban city, and yet a gardener in the Bridgeport area donated this food to a food pantry that otherwise just would have gone to waste. This is the opportunity. This past year, something wonderful happened. Now, most of anybody here work for the federal government? Good, then none of you have heard of this. This is great. Uncle Sam has a program called Feds Feed Families. Now this is Uncle Sam's food drive. This is where uh, all the agencies, commerce, and defense, and interior, they all run a food drive and they all compete to, just like any other food drive you participated in, to uh, collect food and then to give it to local food banks and food pantries, et cetera, et cetera. The traditional jars, canned boxes, no fresh food type of things. After two years of trying and with the final assistance of Congresswoman Trindy from Maine and Michelle Obama's office, Ample Harvest Dialogue was incorporated Defense Feed family. What it meant was for the first time, government employees around the United States learned that they could donate food from their gardens. Now, given that government is the largest employer in the country, and given 35% of the uh, people um, 
on the average are home gardeners. My estimates are one million gardeners in one fell swoop learned about the opportunity to donate food. And it was really kind of cool, I have to tell you, we get Google alerts all the time coming up talking about when Apple Harvest are up. Starting to see blog writers on commerces and on Department of Defense and other blogs coming up. That was really kind of cool. So this is going to be hopefully continuing to go on. But this was something where in one fell swoop, a whole chunk of this country learned that the solution was in the backyard. Um, March 2009, remember that thing I talked about? I registered Apple Harvest the Lord as a domain, spent the nine dollars. Okay. May 20th, 2009, AmpleHarvest.org uh, actually rolled out. May 18th, May 20th rolled out. It rolled out three um, days later than I wanted, which is actually pretty good considering what was involved in building it. And um, for those of you who ever want to build something like this, don't have lawyers in the picture, you can keep things moving very fast. Um, so that was AmpleHarvest.org on day one. It was a local food pantry in New Jersey. Uh, um, June 20, a month later, we're up to 100 food pantries. Uh, that's August 20. On October 15th, and it's pure coincidence, it happened to be World Food Days. We had the 1,000 food pantries across uh, the country that were part of AmbleHarvest.org. And it continued to grow. And today, it's more than, it's close actually, it's more than 7,100 food pantries in all 50 states. Now, you're not seeing Hawaii and Alaska on here, but yes, they're included too. So, I want you to think of each of these dots as a place that now represents an opportunity for people with fresh food in that neighborhood to finally be able to donate food. Now, if you're looking at this map and you're seeing something weird, there is something weird. And it's not just AmbleHarvest.org. Uh, other food programs see some of these. You see a line right down in the middle of the country right over here. And we consulted with other food programs. Why? That's not the Mississippi River. That's right down the center of the country. And a lot of us have been racking our minds trying to figure out food why the lower density, and nobody seems to know, although I did read one book recently that suggested that, that part of the country, the water table is actually lower down, and it might be something to do with that, I don't know. If anybody here has a really good idea as to why ample harvest, there are so many pantries in the east, the north, and the west, and not as much, say, from uh, the southwest up to the Dakotas, please talk to me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But this is what our footprint looks like today. It's one out of every five food pantries in America, 20% of our work has already been accomplished. So we have a long way ahead of us. But this is six years of work, and what Ample Harvest Life should say for the first um, two and a half years was really an aging need working at this home. We now have a tiny staff, but this is still a very, very tiny organization having a huge impact on the country. So what I did to explain uh, the metrics, and people do ask the question, well, how much food? And that's because we all think about the food bank system in terms of how much food, how many meals. We're not a food program. We're a program to eliminate the waste of food. And there's a very good perspective to take a look at that. The discussion has to be not how much food, it's how much opportunity to stop the waste of food. So the question of how many pounds, how many meals, we can't answer that. We, we tried it a little bit. We did do surveys in the beginning. We did discover that food pantries are really, really, really bad at, at measuring the food. Many times they don't get some people. You know, we said, how many pounds have we got? Things on boxes, truckloads, crates, uh, bushels, baskets. We, we, got it. we realized that was, we were barking at the wrong tree. What we did realize was, as a food waste solution, it's essentially a funnel. How big is the funnel? So that red dot down there is Washington, D.C. That's Miriam's Kitchen. That's a soup kitchen that's not far from the White House. It's actually one of the White House kitchen garden actually donates um, uh, fresh food to. And I drew a nine mile radius circle around it. That's about 250 square miles. And then I asked the audience, how many gardeners live in 250 square miles? Now, it depends upon where you are. In Center City, Philadelphia, not many. Go to Bucks County, a lot more. So it depends on where you are, but wherever you are, it's probably not zero. The impact of AmpleHarvest.org is that footprint, that dot, multiplied by these dots. How much of America are we covering, and how much opportunity are we giving to people across the country to recognize that the solution to hunger is going to back up, that they can donate who they should throw away? And this has been one of the challenges for us, I'll be very honest with you, about getting 
financial support from foundation because this is a whole new way of thinking. They're usually thinking about how many pounds of food or how many meals, this is what you'd normally expect. They're not thinking about unplugging a blockage of the food that, that had been blocked in the past. They're just thinking about looking into trucks and stuff like that. So we're in a very different space and it's one that we're, we're struggling to deal with. Yeah, the question is, it says the opportunity. Ultimately, I'd love to get to a discussion on how much nutrition can we get, but we're not in a position to do that yet. You all heard about this, so I figured I'd bring the video for you. Three of millions of hungry Americans rely on food pantries to eat, but often that means a diet of canned and processed food. So when the weeks, this week's CNN hero saw that local pantries were lacking fresh produce, he came up with a simple way to help. Found it in his own backyard. Watch. Pancake mix and syrup. The system we have in America is you donate canned goods or dry goods to a food bank. Fresh produce is almost never available. Horseradish. I had an idea about how to not waste food. We're having an ample harvest. The very least we can do is give it to people who need it. They'll be enjoying this tomorrow in the pantry. Mampleharvest.org enables people who grow food in home gardens to easily find a local food pantry to donate their excess produce to. Nice, big one. We didn't know what doors to knock on, but now that Gary has got this wonderful program, there's some room on her. Taking it to one of the pantries really is the way to share with Ample Harvest. Ample Harvest gives them the ability to easily get that food to somebody who genuinely really needs it. You're not only doing good, you're feeling great about it. Gary Oppenheimer's website is ampleharvest.org. See how one harvest can help a family in need. This came out uh, in April of 2010, less than a year after I launched ampleharvest.org. Um, it was lovely. I was I suddenly started getting a lot more emails from people. I've got uh, food I want to donate. I actually, went, the next day I was actually interviewed on live on CNN. And during the interview, I read a letter I'd gotten the day before from a guy in California who, the prior year, had thrown away eight 55-gallon drums of grapefruits from this property. They were just falling, and now I can donate them to. So this is, uh, by the way, that's what it looks like um, you know, in 2009. So any aging you see is, it's good aging, believe me. <laughs> so the feedback that we've gotten from about ampleharvest.org, I'll just read you a few very short ones, have been a lot of lovely letters from people, people like you. I love what you're doing, good for you, God bless you, it's all nice stuff. We're not doing it for that reason, believe me. It's nice to get the accolades, but this real story is not about what I or my staff is doing. It's what we are enabling 42 million dollars across the country to do. So this is from Jen Chapin, Harry Chapin's daughter. Uh, the concept and design of AmpleHarvest.org is so beautifully simple and so simply beautiful that it's a joy to spread the good news about it wherever I go. Vince Cerf, does that name ring a bell to anybody? He's considered the father of the internet. As a matter of fact, if you watch Saturday Night Live, I think this past Saturday, they did a spoof about it. Uh, let's see, Gary's a terrifically positive message when, at a time when positive messages are in short supply. This is from John Carson, not John E. Carson, but John Carson was President Obama's Director of Community Engagement. Ample Harvest is one of the most innovative groups they've ever met. And check out their centerpieces for pantries program at ampleharvest.org slash holiday. And I'll explain that in a bit. So we've had people that are well known and lots of people who are just regular folks like you or I are saying this is a great idea, this is lovely. So we've had a great deal of excitement about it and uh, tons and tons and tons of media coverage, which has just been lovely. Um, I had mentioned, I'm going to stop from this for a second and go to that on the screen. I mentioned what John wrote about the Apple Harvest Dollar Center pieces for pantries. Um, in October of 2012, I had an idea. It was coming up on Thanksgiving in the holiday season, and people were going to put up whole, you know, bouquets maybe on their holiday tables. And you can't see the person across the table because they put flowers there and stuff like that. So I said, why not replace those whole arrangements of flowers with a nice basket of uncut fruits and vegetables, and then donate that to a food pantry the next day? Why not let it grace your table one day and feed another family the next? 
So we created centerpieces for pantries program, which we trialed also the name of this year's Skip the Flowers, but we're sticking with centerpieces for pantries. You can read about it. Yeah, I'll tell you, FTD did not like that one. <laughs> but you go to ampleharvest.org slash holiday to read about it. When you do have an event, a corporate event, a wedding, or um, um, anything, Think about the bouquet that you buy. They're, by the way, the flowers are often imported from, say, South America, so the environmental cost. Instead of that whole thing, you throw the flowers away the next day. Put in a basket of oranges and apples and whatever else you want, whether you group or bought them, put that in the table. And then you can give that to the bouquet the next day. The food you donate through Ample, as a result of Ample Harvest, it doesn't have to be stuff you grew. It can be stuff that you have. And certainly that would be one way of doing it. So this was a wonderful letter that came from a food pantry. Greatly appreciate that our clients are getting fresh foods during the summer. We appreciate the hard work. It's great to see a child come in and grab a string bean from the table and enjoy it because it's fresh from the garden. You have so many kids in this country who have no idea what fresh food is actually like. I had one teacher write to me in 2010 saying that she brought an apple and a, I think it was an apple, a peach and a cucumber into the classroom. And most of the kids have no idea what it's to this initiative has been overwhelming. Tied to the faith in all kinds of faith communities have been stepping up. Muslim community leaders are hosting sports tournaments to encourage young people to get active. Uh, the Jewish Community Centers Association is working with JCCs around the country to grow gardens and to get fresh food in underserved areas. And they're creating early child wellness programs. Groups like the National Council of Churches have joined with an organization called Ample Harvest to help gardeners donate fresh produce to 4,700 of their local food pantries. Now, I have to tell you that the first lady staff had, uh, had we, and we've had wonderful support from the White House, both the President's Wing and the First Lady's Office. And the President's staff had said, hey, you may want to listen to her speech. This was the first anniversary of Let's Move. They should just celebrate the trip. And I had streaming on my computer. I was doing something else. And she starts talking. And I said, gee, it'd be nice if she talked about ampleharvest.org. And all of a sudden, my wife was wondering, why is he screaming upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the First Lady has not only spoken about ampleharvest.org, but she wrote about it. There's a beautiful tabletop book she wrote called American, uh, uh, American Growth. And, and um, it's a lovely, lovely book. There's a whole sidebar in there about ampleharvest.org. But we, early on, we were partnered with the National Council of Churches. We're not a faith organization. We're not a religious organization. But 70% of the pantries in America are in the house of worship. So us being working in tandem with all faith communities is critical to the success of ampleharvest.org. So we have both landing pages, which are pages you can, Google will bring you to, and brochures for whether you happen to be Christian or Jewish or Muslim. And they were each done by people in that faith community to help us tailor it so that if you happen to be, for example, uh, somebody who's Jewish and you're coming to ampleharvest.org through that Google ad, you'll be seeing a piece that's about something called tikkun olam, which is the Jewish idea of repairing the world. If you happen to be Muslim, you'll see something about Sadaka, which is the Arabic word for doing charity. And Christian, it's really about, it's built around the uh, Christian love story. As I had said that we're tied to the faith community, their ethics to me have to be very important in terms of how something like this works. So the considerations were in here, there's a word ties to all the faiths you're helping the hungry. It's a gleaning function. Uh, there was separate, separation of donor and recipient and just caring for the environment. Very soon, later than I would like, but very soon, you're going to see a new Ample Harvest Dialogue launch. We are rebuilding our technology from the ground up. Ampleharvest.org was hand-coded in 2009 by three volunteers. It's today's held together with digital duct tape. <laughs> I made up the word, but it perfectly describes it. And uh, we're right now having it rebuilt. A whole new look and feel, the new logo, and everything else about it. It's going to be the same organization with many new capabilities on the website, so you're now seeing what our new look is. And we wanted to evoke the idea of offering somebody some food. By the way, the original designer had that in the red up there, and I said we've had enough trouble with people thinking we're apple hogs, that or So we made a green to look more like a tomato. Uh, so this is what the site's going to look like. It's very pretty. Hopefully you'll visit it soon. I talked about this is a bit of a skip the flowers thing. Now, remember I said skip the flowers, we go back to centerpieces for pantries. 
go to ampleharvest.org forward slash holiday. You can read about this. I hope you'll all do this. And, uh, by the way, you're all being asked to donate food and stuff like that around Thanksgiving. People are hungry all year long. People aren't just hungry at the end of the year. So right off the bat, this is the type of thing that whether you're a gardener or not, you can be doing any month of the year to help with hunger and malnourishment in your own community. It's not just at the end of the year. So what makes Ample Harvest Network so impactful that's really gotten people's attention? Number one, it's using existing resources. We don't build new things. Zero logistics. This is the only food program where we can manage things without getting involved in transactions themselves. It works in every community in the country. There's no place. It's like Amazon.com. Okay, some communities have bookstores, some communities don't have bookstores, and every community has Amazon.com. And lastly, it addresses some really pressing needs, hunger, diet-related illnesses, and, and the environment. To me personally, the biggest benefit of Apple Harvest is that it solves the problem. Your typical food program, and this is not in any way dissing any program, they're all doing critically important work, where they ask for money, they buy food, they feed people, and then they're back for asking money to buy food, and that's an endless loop. And people are getting fed, but in the evening, this, this problem isn't being dealt with. The Apple Harvest Road model is get growers connected to people, to the need in the community, and we've sort, of, we've sort of fixed that. We've had wonderful support. Google's been by far our biggest supporter. We get $40,000 a month free advertising from them. And if any of you are running, anybody here running a nonprofit? Anybody? If you don't have it, look, check out Google Grants. Just Google Google Grants. At a minimum, you get $10,000 a month, month over month, not in cash, but in free advertising. And they're very generous with that grant. Um, these other companies have been wonderful supporters of Apple Harvest. Though. We've had amazing support from the White House, the Department of Agriculture, and many of these foundations and, and, and agencies. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be famous. This is the end of 2020. I think any Joe or Jane part of the solution if they use the resources that they have. One of the resources that 35% of households have is a home garden. I'm Gary Oppenheimer. I'm the founder and the executive director of a nationwide nonprofit called AmberHarvest.org. The idea here is to educate and enable gardeners that for the first time they can now donate food to a local food pantry. If there's food that you can't use, preserve, or share, Get it to somebody else who needs it. These are the girls, these are the chickens. Morning girls. They're in the growing season. There was Swiss chard here, beets, carrots. This one here is a butternut squash. In 2007 and 8, I was growing more food than I could use. I found, after some effort, a battered woman shelf here in town, and I took food to them. And the woman who received the food thanked me, and she said, wow, that was going to be fresh food. And that was the start of my learning experience about how the food system in this country for pantries and soup kitchens and shelters almost never have fresh food. This is the first place that was on ampleharvest.org, the first pantry. It's also where I came to learn about how pantries operate. They are basically in the basement of a house of worship, or they're, in this case, in a set standalone building, and just doing their best to try to feed the people in the community. The biggest challenge I have is keeping the shelves of the food pantry full, and you know, trying to supply healthy choices for people. Before Ample Harvest, we did not get very much fresh food at all. It's, it's been awesome because every single weekend we get fresh vegetables. People, again, wouldn't be able to afford this to go out into stores to buy it. So they do very much so appreciate getting it. For a lot of people who love to give charity but themselves are cash strapped, this is a chance for them to reach into their backyard and of their back pocket. It's really been something I just keep seeing places I can take this and keep moving in there. And people keep saying, thank you. By the way, now you saw the first video, CNN, and this is just from December of 2014. Um, the interesting thing about both is they managed to find me when the ground is frozen and I'm not growing anything. If you go back to the CNN video, I'm pulling out horseradish, it overwintered. Some kid in that video, 
they gave him a piece of horseradish. He says, mm, I felt so bad for him. Uh, I wish somebody would come to me to do a video piece in August when I could really show them my robust, um, uh, robust guard. But I have to work with, with, with what they have. So, just to give you an idea of the fiscal side here for a moment. In the way Ample Harvest Network operates, we don't buy food, no logistics costs, we have no local offices, and there's no scaling costs. So the staff of technology, which is equal to about five minutes of feeding America's one billion dollar budget, any of you can do the math and quickly figure that one out. The benefits for reducing, reducing the food, improving the food, the environment, reducing hunger, it's a sustainable solution. From the impact side, now we come to this number. 1.033 billion dollars. Where is this? A little while ago I sat down and tried to find how much is obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes costing America. And according to CDC, American Diabetes Association, and the uh, this other organization for chronic disease, it came out to one. This is what the National Institute of Health spends on the, during the research. This is the economic impact of those diseases. Now, I know about this one doctor, so I'll be, I'll be, I'll be held accountable here. But um, diet affects all of these. Now, if by getting more fresh food that we already own into a food system that doesn't have it, improves, it improves the, the nation's health by 1%, just 1%. We have a $10 billion savings to America. I mean, it's that easy. 2% multiply, whatever the numbers happen to be. Um, and it's going back to the other thing I talked about before, just to give you an idea of the difference between ample harvest over and typical food programs. In a typical food program, and one of our board members is actually executive director of a food bank in California. It's a $20 million annual budget. And they spend part of the money for staff and over and the rest they buy food. And they get people fed and then they have to keep that cycle going all the time, all the time, all the time, because they need to buy more food and feed people. And this goes on and on and on and on and on. Ample harvest that orphan model is a much lower cost, our budget's 500. And you connect the growers to the, the, uh, to the opportunity and you sort of solve that problem. So we're working on actually dealing with the problem. We're actually working not so much to feed people, but to actually get people fed. I've never done this before. I don't know if any of your phones are going to be able to pick this up, but this QR code, if you catch it, it'll take your support page or you can go to Ample Harvest Growth Slides Action. We'd love to see you get involved and join us, join with us on this effort. There are many different ways you can, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. But you can go to Ample Harvest of our size action or slash support. And if you happen to know of a place here in Pennsylvania, or of course the country that's looking for a speaker, you can get that information, Ample Harvest of our size speaker, to, to uh, actually do that there. Z um, minus 10,000 meters. We had no trekkers in the room, or did we have one? Any, you know the reference? All right. Rap, by the way, this is a week after Leonard Nimoy passed away. This is not put in here because of that. I've used this in past presentations, so I want to give due homage to what he did. Uh, I am a trekker, but also just uh, the man himself. But in this particular movie, Rap of Khan, the Enterprise is being beat up on all sides by the bad guys, and they're being outgunned and outnumbered. And um, one of the things that Spock and Captain Kirk used to do is they played 3D chess. This is an early series, and so everybody knew about this 3D chess game. So in this particular movie, at one point, Kirk goes to Spock and says, Spock, do you have any idea that anything we can do? And Spock looks at him and says, Captain, he seems to be, he, the other guy seems to be thinking in only two dimensions. Kirk immediately turns to the helm and says, take us to Z minus 10,000 meters. The idea is, which means go vertically down, but go left to right, go straight down. The idea is, this goes back to solving a problem that you may encounter, that I sincerely believe that many of the solutions and many of the problems we face is actually right under our nose. The solution that I found with ampleharvest.org was not something that took research grant, it didn't take um, anything fancy than just putting pieces together. It was, it's been under our nose the entire time. And I think that the problems that may be important to you, whatever they are that you want to deal with in your community or the country, may well be under your nose. So don't 
don't look too far down the road. Take a look at where you are and what's around you. You may actually find um, that particular solution. Um, I want to thank you all. I really enjoyed this, and I really hope that you guys, ladies and gentlemen, have a lot of questions for me. Uh, I really, really, really enjoyed the Q&A, but thank you very much. Cafeteria food being recycled in effect. Did I get that right? School, school lunch programs trying to change the diet of the students and actually taste frustrating. Okay. Let me take the second one first because I can't answer that, except to say that that's a policy discussion, and I know part of it is USDA telling schools they have to meet certain nutritional programs. We are not an advocacy organization, we're not a policy organization, so we have no official stance on that. And, but even if we did, I'd be out of my league to say I have an answer for you on that. Um, the, the, I, there was a wonderful thing today on Facebook that I saw, and I, you may see it if, if you're on Facebook. Somebody put up, I think, about two dozen pictures of what school lunches look like in different places around the world. It's worth seeing, but and honestly, I'll tell you, the one in the United States did not look quite as appealing as, as some of the others. But let me go to the other question. It's a much more important one, and it's a really, really good one. Um, gardeners like to grow really strange things. Uh, I've grown purple carrots, white carrots. I've grown, anybody know what an Icelandic tomato is? No, it's white. Anybody know what a cream tomato is? It's black. Tomatoes, they come in different colors. Carrots in different colors. So even in somebody who's growing, what is the stuff that's coming in? And it is a real problem. Now there are two, two answers to your question. One is that ampleharvest.org has a very narrow focus, or mission I should say, that is to enable the food to get to the food pantries. We don't tell people what to do with it. We don't tell people how to cook or prepare it. There's lots of other things that could be done. We also don't tell people, by the way, how to grow it. We're that pipe horn. As a nonprofit, I desperately want to avoid what's called Mission Creek, which is getting into a bigger, bigger area, and often one that you're really not very good at. We are partnered with organizations that do that. So strength.org, for example, in Washington, sends chefs around the country to go to food pantries and tell people how to cook. And the National Gardening Association and the Master Garden Program and many others tell people how to plant. We are just that pipeline. Having said that, when somebody is going to donate food, he or she the only one who actually knows what they're donating. I mean, you go out and you buy the seeds, you buy the seedlings, you know what you have. One of the things that we do want to build an ample harvest network is a tool that is going to allow people who donate the food to actually print out a form that says what it is they've donated, but also have some basic information about that food. We've been looking for some funding for that type of piece. It's not there, but it's on, excuse me, it's on right. That would identify the food. I've had this discussion a lot with staff in the past, and I had the perspective that my German-Jewish grandmother and a Creole grandmother make rice two very different ways. 
there's no one recipe for rice. So for us to be presumptive and say, this is how you cook, this would be the wrong solution. My attitude is, this is what it is, go ask your grandmother. That's the best thing that's right to give. Questions? Yes. Well, the food pantries don't throw anything away. I mean, I want to be clear about something. The pantries, almost universally, tell us when food comes in, the shelter. It's the first thing people go to. It's an, you raise a really interesting point, by the way. Um, there are people who have this presumption that if you brought fresh food to a pantry, nobody's going to want it. They want to just go. It's not true. When fresh food is laid out on the table, it's usually the very first thing that people gravitate to. So the idea that it's a wasted effort is totally, totally, totally false. Um, so pantries are not throwing away that food. The, the feedback mechanism, from the we get ad, ad hoc information uh, from the pantries. I read one of them from a food pantry, for example, and you saw another lady in the video talking about it. There's no formal mechanism. As I said, we had tried surveys. The data was all over the place, and we realized it was the wrong question. Um, we are not seeing that. Am, if, am I answering your question? No, I should OK, all right. Yeah, it's, it makes the presumption that if you donate food, particularly fresh food, it is going to be taken home by somebody. It is going to be eaten. And it may well be eaten by a family in which a child has not had fresh food before. The child is used to getting sliced apples with, in celery and we dump instead of a real apple, for example. Or bushy carrots in a can instead of a real crunchy carrot. I mean, that's a whole new experience for some kids. And the hope is that once you know that apples are really crunchy or the peaches can dribble down your face, as you get older, you're going to be wanting to eat more of that stuff unless you get processed stuff. And that will lead to a healthier uh, diet for you. Questions? Yes? Um, can you talk a little bit about chicken? You're talking about chicken story. It's just so funny because lots of girls like, oh, you can't go to the chicken. We so we can talk a little bit about I, want, I live in rural northern New Jersey. I'm on a large property, and I can pretty much have anything I want. It turned out the deed on my property explicitly prohibits oxen to get, but I can have anything else. I was a real disappointment. I always wanted a pet ox. Um, but I went to my wife and daughter a couple years ago and said, I got some chickens. We got the space. And um, they said, we don't want chickens. They're smelly. They're noisy. They're blah, blah, blah. I get some bees, which I thought was kind of a terrifying thing. It's not it's done. And I prevailed, and we got some chickens. Um, we got six girls, but we actually got four girls and two roosters. I got the roosters, I only wanted ten. And um, it turns out there's no smell, and it turns out that there is really no noise to speak of, but there is eggs, and they are a mechanism waste disposal system because all our kitchen scraps go to the girls. And now it becomes an egg or fertilizer every day, which is really, really kind of next. The bizarre thing is that in my town, now mind you, it's a big 80 square mile rural town, up until about six months ago, you had to have more than an acre to have chickens. So people on half an acre couldn't have chickens. Which you might think that's not so bad, except for the fact that chickens are legal in Manhattan. And so now you're trying to figure out how is it that I can be in my apartment or brownstone have chickens, but not in just. I think a lot of it is the uh, an old wives' tale sort of mentality. Look. If any of you go to an old Ward's or Sears catalog from prior to World War II, and just Google it, you'll see it. It's really, really kind of cool. Um, whenever you put a set of dishes, there was always the normal of cups and saucers and plates, and, uh, uh, a, a gravy boat, all these sorts of things, and there was one weird dish in there. It sort of looked like an orange squeezer, except that it had a raised lip with a thread inside. There's only one of them. And it's sort of phased out after World War II. What they were was something that you could take a mayonnaise jar, an empty mayonnaise jar, put water in, screw it on. It's what you kind of gave water to your chicks. Prior to World War II, when you started a family, when someone put your dishes, there was a presumption that you may well have chickens. They were very prevalent across America. And they were a source of corn, a source of eggs, and sometimes <coughs> amusement or whatever. It's the fact that we've stepped away from that. And this is outside the anthropology of our discussion, by the way, even though I have six girls. The, the fact that we stepped away from that is kind of a to me, it's that we stepped away from our food a little bit. 
Um, I think that my neighbors would attest to the fact that the chickens are a non-issue. And in my town, the ones we finally changed the ordinance that you're under an acre, you're limited to six chickens, they discovered the world didn't end, the bears didn't rip up the property, nothing smelled like just went on as it always had. So I would encourage you to tell your town council that if you can have chickens in Manhattan, why can't I have them here? There's roosters make noise. Hands up to the problem. Questions? Yes. I'm active 13 months a year. Ampleharvest.org is, is busy 12 months a year. Uh, first of all, don't think globally, think nationally. In Florida, people grow in the autumn, the winter, and the spring. It's too hot in the summer. So your ag zone, of course, the country influences when people are growing food. But the other piece of it is don't think of this. This is a very, uh, by the way, if you didn't hear the question, what are we doing in the winter? And honestly, this winter I didn't get my cross country skiing in, so that's a bit frustrating. But we're a solution to the waste of food. And if there's no food being wasted in the winter, it's simply an empty pipeline that has to be maintained. We're adding new food pantries, we're still reaching out to growers, because eventually the growers are going to be having food. And by the way, uh, in part of that outreach, the growers were telling them that, you know, you probably never used all the seeds in that seed packet anyway. Typically 30, 40 seeds, how many tomato plants are you going to plant for yourself? But if you knew you could donate food, you might actually plant more stuff. So get it to people early in the year, like in February and March, when they're starting to go through the catalogs and getting itchy about turning over the garden, is a great time to say, you may want to plant a little bit extra if, if that's what you want. We are busy 12 months a year. Um, and um, it's a, for, for one thing, right about, we have nothing to do with that. This, that um, October to December crunch to get um, food, you know, that, that, and all the other food programs. This is 12 months we're growing and expanding and maintaining a virtual pipeline of food. And frankly, also, I should tell you that people who are having a, a centerpiece of the table are going to be meeting at the top stuff in the dead of winter. So, yes? Are we doing anything else with CSAs and farms? And the answer is no, yes, and yes. Okay. Um, there is a whole, this, first of all, again, we're managing a pipeline here. Um, so going to supermarkets and saying that here's a pipeline to help you find a food pantry in your town, we can do that. We don't have the resources for calling every small bodega and small store um, um, in the country. Feeding America does do something akin to that with the major chains. They will get food that's being cycled out and get to the food bank, but again, you have that time delay problem there. So that's not really our really work there. In terms of the CSAs, probably for those who don't know, community supported agriculture is when you buy a share of what the farmers produce in that year, or farmers markets. Yes, if you go to ampleharvest.org slash CSA or slash farmers market, there's flyers there that you can print out and put up at your CSA. We want, when you go to the CSA, if you've got rutabaker and you just don't like rutabaker, take it to a food pantry. Or if you're going on vacation and your allocation is not going to take it, they can give it to a food. So yes, that can be done there. Ditto for farmers markets. At the end of the day, some farmers are going to take everything back and some are going to say, I'm just not going to bother with this stuff. That food can be gotten to the food pantry too. The issue with that particular thing is a logistics one. Remember, we're not moving any food. We don't have trucks, we don't have vans. So the issue is the, the farmer's market making an arrangement with the nearest food pantry. Whether the food pantry picks it up, whether the farmer's market takes it over, or whether a volunteer, I'm sorry, actually does it, that has to be arranged locally. But the answer is yes. As long, look, from my perspective, the issue is that the food should be eaten by somebody. Is it you? Somebody you gave it to you? Did you preserve it? Did you sell it? All are great, but if it's not going to be eaten, get it to somebody who really needs it. And again, that can be a CSA, your home garden. <clears throat> By the way, we're talking about gardens. There's also rooftop gardens, kitchen gardens, herbs. I mean, I don't think it has to be a big amount of food. It can be a small amount. 
Yes? How do you find the Oh, God, that's a difficult problem. That's where we spend a lot of time. Remember that thing that you can't find them? We can't find them either. We work with the food banks. It's word of mouth. It's people who go to a house of worship and they say, we have a food pantry, and they find out it's not on ampleharvest.org. Um, it's, it's an ongoing, actually, I have a list in my pocket. I should tell you this. Day. Of um, the food pantries in the towns where they signed up today or yesterday? Ah, no, it's not. I'm sorry. In the past three days, about a dozen food pantries across the country have signed up. They hear about it. There's an exchange of information with other food pantries. People in the community go to them. One of the things on Ample Harvest Dogs last action is to ask you to find a food pantry in your town and encourage them to sign up on amplehawks.org. There are things that people on, who have boots on the ground in the community can do that nobody else can do. And you go to the food pantry manager with a flyer that we give you and it says, listen, um, there are four things you tell me the food pantry. Number one, it's free. Number two, you don't need refrigeration. Number three, you don't need storage. And number four, it's free. You gotta say that one twice because that's really important to that. And to sign up for this, you are then making yourself visible to the people in your community who really, really help you. More than that, they'll then sign up. But it's, a, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry? Oh, we're not telling you to create a pantry. If you want, if, 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 if you are, if, if your question is how do I make a pantry, in, I would contact the regional food bank in this area of Phil Abundance and say, I want to get a pantry. In. That's their stuff. We have nothing to do with people creating pantries. We're linking pantries that already exist to the food in the community. I wouldn't even begin to tell you what the legal or any other requirements are. Yes? Did you have a question? Yeah, the answer is about uh, food pantries in, in college settings, and the answer is, you're absolutely right, there are college students who have to choose between buying books and buying a meal, and it's a really difficult problem. I'm actually on the board of advisors of Campus Kitchens and uh, Food Recovery Network, which are two organizations, and they're excellent organizations that are focused on the university level of getting pantries set up and recovering food, by the way, so that when somebody goes home, maybe for a Christmas break or at the end of the year, they can get the food, that's the extra cans or whatever that are left over and get them to uh, the food pantry there that are needed. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the pantries, it's a difficult thing on college campuses for some kids, I, I get that. And these, part, these are the organizations that are tailored for doing that. They are on the college campus. So we work with them and in coordination with them, but we are not actually on the campus itself. But yeah, you know, I remember when I was in college a long time ago and I was not eating the healthiest of food, I could go through a box of sugar for some mini wheats in one sitting. <laughs> Which has had a subsequent health issue, by the way, but yeah, so. Did that answer your question? Anybody else? Yes. Yes, um, a little bit earlier we were discussing food jobs. You were saying that they probably aren't the best means of getting food to those who need it. Um, but you didn't give me the reason why. Yeah, thank you. This gentleman is from the school here, and we were discussing that school has food drives two or three times a year, collecting jars, cans, and boxes, and the normal stuff. And I said, don't do that again. You're contributing to uh, hunger. And I got a very quizzical look, which is the typical reaction. If Remember I said that the food pantries are buying food from the food banks at 10 cents on the dollar? Remember that earlier thing that 
that you can't just go and they can buy the food easily, easily discounted from the food banks. Well, when you donate any food, you bought it at a store, it's been in your kitchen, and you take it to the food pantry, that's good. If you're, your heart's in the right place, you've done the right thing. But if you had given the pantry the dollar value of the food, instead of actually buying the food, they could have bought 10 times the amount of food from the food bank. So your $2 can of peas could have become 10 cans of peas for $2 if you'd simply given them $2. Now, my wife has said to me, but people like the touchy-feely component of, of giving the cans or the boxes, and I get that, but reality is, when the Red Cross actually said we need help because of Haiti or whatever, nobody went into their closet and mailed them a blanket. They wrote a check and they knew the Red Cross would buy the blanket. So my argument is that if you're going to have a food drive, to the extent possible, ask people to donate whether it's cash <coughs> or checks. And even if it's a small amount, if it's a two dollars or five dollars that you would have bought a box of pasta for, it will go ten times as far if they've given the food pantry the money than if they've actually bought the food, and they should be trusting the pantry to spend that money wisely and not be worried that something is spent. That's the answer to your question, so thank you so much for asking that. Hey, Gary, thank you for that awesome presentation. Thank you.